we're okay now we are live we are live here with sergeant major and miss robin downs of yoga flava my name is bahamia i am nurse in the know and you are joining us here in our caregivers embracing elder care uh we, we want to call this a Sunday program because we've been, I think, going pretty consistently for a while and it's been such a great time. We've decided to continue uh, along the journey of caregiving and helping people embrace their elder care journey. So Robin, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce yourself to our audience and those who are watching. Hi, my name is Robin Downs, and I'm here with my father, Sergeant Major William Downs, um, U.S. Army retired. And um, I have had the honor of being my father's primary caregiver for approximately the last three years. You know, time is flying when we're having fun, huh, Dad? Right. <laughs> and um, prior to that, I have a, um, uh award-winning background in media and in um, the healing arts, specifically yoga. My brand is Yoga Flava, and I say not just yoga, also the flavor of life. And upon the journey, um, in terms of being the primary caregiver for my father, I've been sharing my yoga practice with him, and I have seen how it's helped both of us. And I really wanted to pass the tools that I've used along to others. Um, and in researching other people who are involved with the elder care process, that's where I've come to learn about Bahamia and geriatric care management. So I'm so delighted that the two of us can col collaborate um, on caregivers embracing elder care. The pleasure is mine. I am super excited, super pumped. Today, we are going to be talking about, well, actually the continuation of our conversation for our care plan development. But um, we've decided to structure our show in a way that kind of gives us a nice flow. And uh, Robin, I'll let you uh, go ahead and take the floor on this one. We wanna do the meditation and, and yoga. Well, we, we'll hold off on the yoga, it's up to you, but, um, we want to start off that way just to kind of get us in a good space. Right. And just to keep things simple as we continue to grow the show and grow our format and our technical skills, well, I like to start with the breath. And in particular, today, we'll, st we'll start with um, the left palm on your lower belly and your right palm on your heart. So with the left palm on your lower belly, inhale, full belly breath and exhale, really pull the belly button back towards your spine and up towards your heart. Now continue to breathe deeply and with your palm on your heart, just have a sense of really feeling the affirmation, I am love. So really sending loving, healing energy that goes to your heart and allowing your heart to send that energy throughout your entire body as you breathe deeply, just inhaling fully, exhaling fully, soften your face, soften your neck, soften your shoulders, and just saying to yourself, I am love. Continuing to breathe deeply, Exhale fully, I am love. And just really allowing that loving vibration to permeate throughout all your organs, your entire body, allow that energy to embrace your being so that your aura permeates an energy of love. May you take these feelings with you and share them with all you meet. The spirit in me honors the spirit in you. Thank you, Robin. That was amazing. Sergeant Major, did you enjoy that? Yes, ma'am. Now, do you guys practice that on a daily basis? Is that something you regularly do? Yes, I do it as, as often as I can. And I especially like to take time to uh, to meditate. Uh, my father may have something going on with his head. And you know, I've been pretty transparent with the fact that I use the app called Calm. It's really interesting for me to, you know, press a button until I get my playlist totally up to speed and just utilize that as a tool where both of us could just, you know, listen to a guided meditation if I'm not doing it. And I find that the third party just kind of helps anyway in it general. Does. 
now. Um, and maybe as I do future recordings and the two of us do future recordings, because he is starting to uh, watch himself on some of the pre-recorded uh, yo chair yoga videos and starting to you know watch his own practice and get involved that way. But um, so I try to incorporate it in a lot of different ways. And this is helpful also. So just right now being in the moment and having this as a part of our lifestyle. Yes, absolutely. And you spoke about embracing the flavor of life. So yes. yeah. Nice. I'm, I'm working on it. I've been trying to remind myself to meditate at least 10 minutes a day. I'm doing the best that I can to keep it up. But um, I've learned that, you know, through the breathing exercises that I've done with my client caregivers and their loved ones with dementia, it's helped them to kind of quiet that anxiety sometimes that we've talked about. So I think we can kind of segue into where we're going with today's topic for our caregiver care plan. Um, for the last, I want to say three weeks now, we or four weeks actually, this is our fifth, um, we've been building a care plan or the perfect care plan for your caregiver. And every week we've decided to take some kind of a section topic that I would build a care plan around for my caregiver clients. And today's topic is, drum roll please, <laughs> um, we're talking about, well, we're talking about two things, kind of two of the same, finances and documentation. So here's where I know Sergeant Major had a few things to say about, you know, where he or how he planned for this season of his life. Uh, finances is a huge deal when it comes to caring for your aging loved one, for any elder in general. But because, you know, our seniors tend to live on a fixed income, working, working their whole life and then getting, you know, their Social Security or whatever it is that they have for retirement may or may not cover all of the expenses for aging in place particularly. So today we're gonna to talk about a little bit of, of everything in a way, but first I wanna talk ask you, Robin, what was your experience when it came to documentation and just kind of managing the finances for caring for your dad? Well, before I became the primary caregiver for my father, I remember visiting in his home in the Bronx when he was living with his lady friend and asking him about his documentation. And he, he proudly pulled out a folder that had resources to create documentation, but there was no documentation in there. There was a phone number for the United Federation of Teachers. And I was like, okay, dad, I'm happy you have the phone number. When are we going to call that number? Mm -hmm. And he was kind of like, I'll get to it. So, um, so that was a little frustrating because of course I didn't want to pressure my father and I wanted him to be able to, to do things in his own time. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I was beginning to see signs that he needed more assistance and greater support. Mm -hmm. So it was also, um, it was kind of a, a team of myself, my sister and, and her son that kept asking for this documentation to be in place. Mm -hmm. And when the courts got involved and adult protective services got involved to make a long story short, my father was like, whoa, I better call this number that the United Federation of Teachers gave me for a lawyer. Yeah. And um, he called that number and the lawyer put the paperwork together. And it took, and that took some time also because um, my father hadn't really thought through some of those hard pressed issues in terms of who exactly do you want to be your po point person, your spokesperson when it comes to health and finances, when you can no longer um, think for yourself. So um, I realized when he was struggling, I needed to kind of step up and even kind of prove myself to my father that I'm here for you, I love you, you know, I want to help you and, you know, whatever I need to do to make you feel comfortable, I'm here to make you feel comfortable. You raised some really really good points, Robin. I think not, you know, just kind of in general 
caring for your aging loved one and having to kind of be the parent in this role um, is sometimes is not only challenging, but it's very misguiding because you're not parenting your parent, but you're actually having to really structure their life because they may not have gotten to that space and there are things that need to be done. And it's interesting. And I don't know because I've been doing a lot of research with, you know, the whole dynamics of caregiving, but someone, you know, made a point of saying that, you know, I'll never be my father's parent. Nope. So that's where, you know, for me, it's easy because I could shift to, okay, Sergeant Major and, and give him that respect. So whatever language, mm -hmm. you know, because in the beginning part, when everybody was kind of on his case, he was just like, I don't appreciate these people talking to me like I'm a child. Right. So he definitely felt that there was a shift in the way people were treating him. And I had to figure out how best to navigate to still give my father his dignity and at the same time, let him know that it's okay to accept help. Right, it's a big deal. Big deal. You heard him when he needs it. When I need it. When you need it, when you need it. No, big deal. That is very fair, Sergeant Major, because I think a lot of the times, um, you know, as children, of our loving parents, right? We tend to want to go in hyper mode because we love you. We love you and we want it the best for you. And if we see that you're not, uh, or uh, some things aren't going as well as they could be, we want to do the best that we can to support that situation. And yeah. I, always, I always use words like, you know, I wanna be a good team. You know, I know you're bringing things to the table and I am too. So how could we work this out as a team? Mm -hmm. So once again, those are the type of words that I've used that he uses. Um, and, um, and, and, and lately I have to say that I really appreciate how much you've been appreciating, you know, all the things I'm able to do to be supportive of you. Well, I didn't put anything. Um, everything is, there's nothing going wrong at this time. Right, because you I'm not causing any problems you're financially. Absolutely, you're absolutely right, Dad. You're absolutely right. You put a lot of things in place. Yeah, All I is did. really good. That's <laughs> yeah. true. That's true. And I think that you are very blessed and fortunate to have had this work really well. And I do know that there are people who have got this not even a little bit figured out. So kudos to you, Sergeant Major, for getting those things in order because it relieves so much stress and pressure for your kids to just be able to be your kids and loving you instead of having to figure all this stuff out that may or may not be you know, stressful or may or may not be helpful if they've got other things going on. And Bahamia, you know, if he sees me running around and I get a little overwhelmed, he was just like, Robin, do you need help? I'll get help if you need help. Yes. So. Awesome. Yes. That's a big deal. Great. Because we, I think as caregivers too, tend to not be able to ask for help for whatever reason. Um, you know, it's like, nope, I've got it. No, I've got it. I've, I've had plenty of clients who just won't accept it because for many reasons, you're feeling guilty that you have to ask for help or you really want to be able to do everything. And a lot of it is honest. A lot of it is, in a, is, is rooted in the right space, but it doesn't serve you as being that the, the caregiver that you could be if you are burnt out, right? If you're overburdened. So I just wanted to kind of go into a few of the documentation um, biggies that I think people either don't know about, they don't talk to their loved ones about, or they just haven't kind of put in order in terms of what, what needs to be prioritized. So the first and foremost, if you don't get any of the legal stuff done, I always recommend having an advanced directive. I think that's something that people are becoming more and more familiar with, especially given our current climate. Um, you know, people kind of unexpectedly going into the hospital and having to be intubated or unexpectedly having to have some kind of major surgery and not being able to consciously make certain decisions for themselves. So I always tell people an advanced directive doesn't necessarily just mean that, you know, you're going to be unconscious and someone is going to take over your life and, and call the shots. It means that you had a conversation with someone you really trust and they know what your wishes would be if something were to happen to you that you didn't have control over or you couldn't even verbally express what your wishes were. 
So that's number one. Advanced directives come in many different forms. Um, you can get as legal as doing the durable power of attorney, which would have some advanced directives in it. It doesn't go through the nitty gritty of a healthcare advanced directive. So I always recommend having a healthcare advanced directive in conjunction with- Is that the same as healthcare proxy? Yes. So the healthcare proxy is uh, basically identified in the healthcare advanced directive. So the advanced directive is the total document. The proxy is the individual that you have assigned. And that person is listed, you know, first and last name in that document. And you, along with maybe your physician or your nurse practitioner would, and, and also your healthcare proxy, if they are a part of your healthcare circle, would go through the different wishes of what you would want in terms of end of life care, or even if you were not able to verbalize and communicate things that you did and didn't want, you would work that out in the healthcare advance directive. So, I don't understand that. If something, <clears throat> if, if something were to happen to you and you were like oxygen, you were unconscious, you were out of it, um, you have papers in place to say, well, Robin will consult with the doctors and figure out the best way to take care of me. I'm glad I got it done. Yes, yes. I'm glad you got it done too, because some people wait and don't get it done. Good point, Sergeant Major. Uh, they don't get it done and they're in the situation being in the hospital and they can't make a decision because they physically can't, right? And they're left or they're leaving their loved ones to make certain decisions for them. And their loved ones don't know what to decide. They don't know what would be the best thing to do because sometimes it involves a significant surgery, um, some kind of uh, treatment that may be risky. Uh, there are certain things within making those decisions that you don't want to leave to somebody when they're emotional too. Because when you think about it, you have those papers in place already. So you went to the lawyer. Yes. And you have those papers in place. If you want, after we get off of here, I'll show you. I didn't understand that. Um, the paperwork, it just gives someone the authority, if you can't speak for yourself, to speak on your behalf for the best procedure that needs to take place for you. Thank you. And that's really the, you, you, you really explained it really well, Robin. That's really the whole nuts and bolts of it. It's not anything super complicated. And you can always get a lawyer. I always recommend that because the lawyer can not only do your advanced directives, they can help you with your power of attorney, and they can also help you with your estate planning. Elder law attorneys are amazing. They know, you know, what- Do we have are. one? Yes, you do. You went through the UFT. And once again, I'll, I'll pull out the paperwork. But who's the, who's the lawyer? Um, his, I'll show you the paperwork when, when after this is over. I don't remember him. Okay, so I'll pull it out for you. And I'll, you and pull I'll it out. You. What about showing me him? Um, when this is over, we'll review all of that. And if you want to take a meeting with him again, you can. I'm confused. Okay, it's been a while since that paperwork was set up. Um, it's been three years since that paperwork was set up, and it was set up at a time that he, he was you were in and out of the hospital, and that's why it was set up because you know even the fact that you're here, Dad, is amazing. I didn't know if you were going to make it, so um, so things were set up about three years ago, and I'll be happy to go over everything once we finish with this broadcast. Awesome. So that's pretty much what I wanted to kind of put out there today was just to start to have these conversations. And if you need some guidance, if you need some assistance, always reach out to your physician to kind of help you through the healthcare piece. And then if you ever have to seek legal advice or anything like that, go to a specialist because sometimes people end up kind of just going to um, a general attorney or their friend who is an attorney. And not that it's a bad thing. And but, just to remind my father, once again, Dad, you were in the hospital and you pulled out from your wallet. You probably still have it in there. UFT, um, legal services, elder care, estate planning. And you were able to call them up and you, you had a specialist that dealt with elder care and estate planning. I don't so, remember. Okay. So that's why I'm reminding you and I'll be happy to pull out the documents once this is over. 
Okay. And the last the guy? What'd you say? Yeah, for sure. Okay, I, I don't remember. Okay, yes. The last part I wanted to talk about was insurance. So, um, Robin, can you tell our audience if there was any issues with insurance? Because I think a lot of people have Medicare or they have Medi-Cal, or in, in my we're in California, so we have Medi-Cal, but others have Medicaid, and it's very confusing, right? Were there? I know it. I know it. So, were there any? What were? If there were any, what were your biggest roadblocks for insurance? Uh, <clears throat> the paperwork, because my father has um, Medicare, right? And Part A, Part B, all that other stuff. Yeah. Like, but he okay, yeah. he has that. Also, he's a veteran. Awesome. He has medical um, benefits by yeah. being a veteran, and also he's a World Trade first responder. Uh, and he has medical benefits with that. Wow. And also he does have long-term care okay. and catastrophic major medical wow. and supplemental health uh, insurance. Yes. I don't remember all that. <laughs> He's covered. Put his yeah. in. He's like, oh, I got all this coverage. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Yes. So some of it even was discovering stuff after the fact. Like my father in 2017, he was hospitalized, rehabilitation, and um, and an emblem covered a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And with his catastrophic major medical, it had a certain deductible that needed to be met for other things to come through. And I just so happened to get a notice from them. And it, there was like a little window that if I didn't apply in that certain time frame, he would not have been able to get oh, wow. um, reimbursed for some of the out of pocket expenses he, set, he spent when he was first um, setting up working with an aide. Okay. So there was a time period before the insurance kicked in mm -hmm. where he was working with an aide and I knew that his long-term care insurance would cover half. I'm like, wow, that's nice. And then I discovered that he had catastrophic major medical that would pay for the other half. Amazing. And once I found out about that, I was able to apply and retroactively he was able to get money. Thank goodness it was within the time frame. But if I didn't and I think even my cousin was here helping me. If I didn't have that help and do that due diligence and look through all his, you know, looks and cranny, my friend uh, says, you know, shaking the money tree. Yeah. I could have easily to the day missed that yes. particular insurance that he has. Wow. And um, I have to just bring up one example. One of my very dear girlfriends, as a matter of fact, I have her looking out for, for me, mm -hmm. um, said that when her aunt, fell ill and her mother and her just took the aunt into their house right? Um, because they didn't know what insurance she had. When they did find her insurance and did put in the claim for $2 million worth of insurance that she had for, I don't know, home care, whatever, whatever it was, it was $2 yeah, million yeah. Dollar policy. They were too late. Oh. They were too yeah. late. It's a and shame. They weren't able to claim. And I knew, she, you know, the woman who put the policy in place just knew she had like two million that I'll be taken care of. But if you don't tell anybody you got the policy, how are you going to be taken care of? And, I, and, I, and that makes me sad because I even feel like whoever issues these policies should really make sure that there is a person in place to manage the policy. But I really feel that they make it difficult on purpose. Not that money. It's I, so it's a catch twenty two, right? It's not it's it's difficult because I think well, first of all, there are no insurance policies, long term care insurance policies like there used to be. These insurance policies that you're speaking of, that much money for that kind of care is almost unheard of. So that part I do agree with you in terms of these insurance companies aren't trying to outwardly expose themselves as still having these active policies. Agreed, agreed. Um, and that's why it's so, 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 so important to have someone else in the picture, be it a geriatric care manager or a case manager um, or a social worker that can help kind of look up these benefits. Well, I was gonna say even 
the social worker. I mean, I think I remember calling mm -hmm. the UFT. I didn't feel that they were helpful at all. No. I remember filing one claim and, you know, I wish they would have directed me to another department. Um, they were like, oh no, he's not eligible here, but they he was eligible like over know, there. Yeah. And yeah. I was referred over there. I was just like, oh, oh, okay. And so and yeah, and that's where the ball got dropped. So mm -hmm. in that sense, okay, there's that there's that catch twenty two where here we are, who's what case manager? Is it his insurance? Is it somebody that, you know, so it really does get dicey because you can have a case manager for many different aspects of the care that don't all necessarily have the benefit of Sergeant Major's care at yeah. heart have the benefit of the insurance company at heart, right? Mm -hmm. So they may not, it's like I called the airline the other day to cancel an airline ticket and rebook. She told me all these great prices and they were good. Air travel right now is great. And then I said, well, what's the least expensive rate for that day? And she said, oh, well, I have a direct flight for $35. <laughs> but she wasn't giving up that information. She wasn't giving it up. <laughs> not, I mean, we had already almost booked the $120 ticket and that was fine because I thought, you know what? That's a pretty good rate, right? $35. But I didn't, I mean, I knew to ask because something told me, hey, ask. But it wasn't something that she would have just volunteered. And so that's where the insurance companies kind of come from as well. You have a lot of people who have more than 100 to 150 cases that they have to kind of manage. So going into the nitty gritty isn't really going to be their top priority. But when you work with someone like a case manager like myself or care manager like myself or someone that is privately hired by you, so for you, then they will know kind of where to look per se. And what do you pay your care manager? What? <laughs> well, so it, it gets set up in different ways, Sergeant Major. Good question. A care manager is definitely a private expense, and they can kind of talk to you more on what your needs are. So they may charge you per hour, or they may charge you per um, package deal, depending on what needs to happen. So every case is different. Very good question, Sergeant Major. So how do you get the right help? True. Good. You're right. You're right, Sergeant. Great question. I love it. Um, so, so two things. Where do you find a care manager or someone that can actually help you with that? Uh, there's one, I think, go-to website, and it is what the uh, certifying agency kind of uh, of wait, care. Wait, wait, wait. But isn't that what you do? That's what I do. It is what I do. It is what I do. You well, talked to Bahamia, Dad. <laughs> we found her. We found you can her. always call me. You can always <laughs> call me. Come on. <laughs> I know. I know. But for those, of the, for those of you who don't have me close by, <laughs> I, I work virtually. Um, but a lot of the times, depending on where you're going with your caregiver journey, it really does take somebody to be right there with you. So um, if you have an issue of bringing someone from their individual living environment to a assisted living or something like that, I would want to be right there helping you along that way. But if it's just phone conversations, then we can totally do that virtually. Go ahead. You were going to say something. Yeah. So that's what Bahamia does. And that's why I, uh, the two of us have partnered because I appreciate the expertise that she has, and she's been appreciating observing the way the two of the two of us um, work together as a team. Well, I thank you to you working together to help me. Thank yes. you. Thank did you, you. Hear that, Bahamia? I did. I did. I did. Thank you. We are working together to help you, Sergeant Major. Whatever we can do, but you know what? Robin's got a lot of this down. So this is why it's such a great collaboration because she can talk to the people who are watching from where she was and where many people are now and to where you guys are today. So it's been a, a long journey and she can kind of help people along that way. But very good question, Sergeant Major, because I do want to say the Aging Life Association is probably the number one space where you can find certified care managers, uh, but also in and around your community, depending on who your physician is, if they're a geriatric physician, they can they should be able to recommend you to a care manager that will assist you. And you can always uh, 
locate me on either Instagram at, at Nurse in the Know or Facebook at, at Nurse in the Know. And you click the link in my bio and it gives you all the good stuff and information. So you hear that, Robin? I yeah. do. And that's why we're talking to her dad. Okay. Now, Bahamia, yes. money has been the most active mm -hmm. my father has been yes. on this platform. Yes. yes. We don't want to forget about it. So I think that's really interesting that out of all the uh, topics, you have been the most engaged in this yes. conversation, Dad. I appreciate that. Well, he's, but he's on the finances. He's, he's all on the finances. He totally is. He he's really taking is. care of it. So proud of you yes. about that. I'm yeah. glad I got finances. Yeah, I'm glad I have finances too, Sergeant Major. Finances are everything. And so I think, um, is there anything else, Robin? I know we're getting close to time. I just wanted to kind of get on here about the financial conversation. We can definitely continue this a little bit more next well, week. Well, I just really want to say I'm so happy that you are making yourself visible because I did have a challenge finding a geriatric care manager, which is why I reached out to you and to see what we could do to help others and continue to educate myself. So I just really want to commend you for all that you're doing to you. Um, be visible because because I had a hard time when I first was trying to figure this all out. So I appreciate right. it. Thank you. Absolutely. And I just, I you know, for me, the joy of this is being able to help people get to a more comfortable space in their caregiver season quicker. Because instead of having to do all this, you know, chasing or chasing your tail around, you can have somebody that can directly just answer the questions, tell you who to call, who needs to be talk to about what and everybody can move on with the journey, right? Yes. Awesome. So we, I think we're kind of coming to the end of our session. Is there anything that you have, Sergeant Major, that you would like to share with the audience or uh, express about our show here? Well, I'm a little confused, but um, I'm happy that everything is going to help us. Yeah, I love it. Yes, absolutely. And I want to thank you guys just from the bottom of my heart for always showing up. I think everyone who's watching is learning so much from your experience and just being able to be open about what you've gone through, what challenges that you've had um, is, I think, not only helping people, but it's giving that positive energy out there for people who are along the journey to be able to just hang in there, um, even when it's not so great. So thank you again. Big, big, big thanks. And for all of our audience who's come out every Sunday to watch us and you know um, engage with us, we will be back here next week, Sunday, as usual, same time, same place. Um, I think that's all I've got for today. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. And don't forget to join our Facebook group, Caregivers Embracing Elder Care. We are live where our numbers are coming up on that group. I think it's gonna be a very big group, Robin. I'm super excited. It's a great yeah. support center. Yes, it is. It is. All right, everyone. Thank you so, so much. Have an awesome week and continue to love on yourselves and take care of yourselves as you're taking care of your loved one. All right, guys, this has been great. Adios. 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 Bye. Bye.